So long, if everyone can settle down, inshallah, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Bismillah, salat, wassalam, ala rasulillah. Just a few announcements before we begin, inshallah. Um, if everyone can turn their phones onto silent, um, and if anyone's blocking the car park, um, can you move your car now so we don't disturb the lecture? And just one more announcement before we start. Tomorrow we have a seminar delivered by Dr. Abdul Majid Ali from Luton. And inshallah, we'll be talking about trials and tribulations. Um, so that's tomorrow at 4.30. Um, it's a three-hour seminar due to finish at 7.30. So I encourage uh, brothers and sisters to attend and benefit, inshallah. And today's lecture is, in, is entitled Life in the Grave and will be delivered by Sheikh Abu Osama. So I'll pass you all to Sheikh, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And alhamdulillahi na'hmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amanina Man yahdihillahu fala mudillalahu wa man yudlil fala hadiyalahu Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahtahu la sharika lahu Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار In actuality, إخواني وأخواتي This lecture was the lecture of brother Suhail, Suhaib, who is from Glasgow. But he called and he said that he wasn't able, he won't be able to deliver it. So they asked me to step in on his behalf, which I did. So I had been given some outlines about some issues to deal with and to discuss. Obviously, if this remained the daros and the lecture of Brother Suhaib, maybe he would have dealt with it a little bit differently. But nonetheless, the issues that I was given are all important. The four issues that I was given are all important. So one of the issues as it relates to the grave is the common question that comes to our community as it relates to the actual visitation of the grave. We're doing a series here. On Friday is about the etiquette of the masjid and the different types of masjid and what we should do and what we should not do in the masjid. As we mention all the time, the religion of Allah Azza wa has given and explained to us everything we need to do. So when it comes to the issue of dealing with the graves, visiting the graves and all of that, it's very clear. Unfortunately, this is one of the times and one of the places one of the places where a lot of disobedience to Allah occurs from our community because of ignorance or because people are trying to be sincere and they're trying to please Allah, but they're trying to do it in a way that the Sunnah doesn't sanction. So let's just say very quickly that when the Prophet came, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to the people in Mecca, he didn't allow the Muslims to visit the graves. 
They were not allowed to go to the graves in the beginning of Al-Islam. And that is because they were newly converted, reverted to the religion. So many of the people still were carrying with them baggage and luggage from Jahiliya and the practices that the people of Al-Jahiliya used to do at their graves. So sometimes these practices, they are ingrained in people. It's kind of difficult to get them out. Take some time, knowledge. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the Muslims moved to Al Medina, he told them, Laqad kuntu nahaytukum an ziyarat al qubur, fazuruha, fa innaha tu dakirukum bil akhira. I used to prevent and prohibit you people from visiting the graves when we were in Mecca and you were new Muslims. And many of you, not all of you, you can't imagine. Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali. You can't imagine them going to the graves in Mecca and doing crazy things. But there were some people who were new to Islam. Not everyone from the companion is on the same level of knowledge. There were people who were Bedouins. And they're not like Abu Bakr and Uthman and Ali and so forth and so on. So he told them, I used to prevent you people from going to the graves when we were in Mecca. But now I'm telling you, I'm commanding you, I'm encouraging you, go to the graves now, visit them. And the reason why I want you to do that is because they will remind you of the hereafter. So even if a person doesn't go to the grave because it's his relative, he just follows the janazah or just takes time out of his schedule to go to the grave just to spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes there just to contemplate this is your final destination, ultimately, that will remind a person of the hereafter. That general hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is applicable to men and it's applicable to women. Because this issue comes up as well all the time. And a death that happened recently to a member of our community, actually one of my students who comes to almost all of the classes, he lost his grandmother, may Allah have rahmah upon her. She was washed, prayed on, and buried by a community here in Birmingham that doesn't pay a lot of attention to doing things the right way. Emphasis is, do, is, is given to doing things according to the culture. So people say things like, from the culture, well, it's permissible for the grandchildren to see the dead person after it has been washed, but it's not permissible for the husband or the wife or the son or the daughter and people make haram what Allah didn't make haram. And they make halal what Allah didn't make halal. At a time that's already difficult. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's the ta'ziyah in al-Islam. The ta'ziyah. When someone dies, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't take a bunch of the community members to go to the house of the dead person. And now the people who are the relatives of the deceased... They have to cook food and they have to have hospitality to 40, 50 people, three days in a row. He didn't do that. He didn't do that at all. The people are already suffering when his cousin, Jafar ibn, Ali, Jafar ibn Abi Talib, when he died, the Prophet told his family, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the family of Jafar, they're suffering, they're going through a lot. So you people go and make food for them. And when the Muslims saw the relatives of Jafar in the street, that's when they would say to them, A'zam Allah ajrakum. That's when they would say, Inna lillahi ma a'ta wa lillahi ma akhada. And they would start saying those things. Now obviously, close relatives, they go to support. As for every Amr, Bakr, and Zayi from the community, go and show their respects. Now they have to cook for everyone and take care of everyone. That cultural thing is a problem. Because they're already dealing with a musibah. So the point here is, as it relates to this issue of the grave and death, our religion taught us everything of what we should do and what we should avoid. So when he told the people to visit the graves because they will remind you of the hereafter, that is a general hadith, a general statement. The Prophet said that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the men, and it included the women as well. So it is permissible for our wives, our daughters, our sisters, the women of this community, it's permissible for them to go to the graves. Now, there is some ikhtilaf between the scholars of Al-Islam 
And the scholars, when they had ikhtilaf in the past, especially and now, their ikhtilaf is in their intelligence, in their uqul. He understood the hadith that way, he understood it another way. But the ikhtilaf with the people today is in the hearts. So when someone disagrees with you, they get upset that you took the other position. So I do acknowledge that there is another position. That it's not permissible for women to visit the graves. But I think if you were to really look at the hadith, inshallah, those scholars who took the other position are on the truth. So the first issue we want to talk about concerning the graves is visiting the graves. The permissibility, everybody should take time out at some point to go to the grave, whether it's your relative or not. Don't wait for the day of the Eid and only on that day you go to visit your relative because of the Eid. The Eid is a happy occasion. And the Prophet didn't tell the people, wait for the day of the Eid. He said that the Eid is the day of drinking and eating. It's a day of celebrations, not the day to go to be sad like that. As it relates to the women. There is an authentic hadith where he says, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la anallahu zuwarat al qubur May Allah curse the women who visit the graves. That is a clear hadith. Any Arab who hears those words, the kalam, it doesn't take your mind here or there. La anallahu zawarat al qubur. May Allah curse the women who visit the graves. So some scholars said, based upon this authentic hadith, women can't go to the grave. But other scholars said, no. Something is going on linguistically in this hadith that is pretty clear that any Arab would know this is a fact. And that is that the Prophet called them and he described those women, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he called them zawarat on the sigan mubalaka, fa'al. Like the ayah said, Allah is fa'alun lima yurid. Whenever a word comes with that wazen, fa'al, it shows a lot of whatever the word is describing is taking place. Like al-ghaffar. Al-ghaffar means he has a lot of maghfirah. Not a little bit. A lot. So they said that the hadith is talking about those women who make it their job and their business to practically live at the grave. Those women who go to the grave day in and day out. And they're sitting at the grave. And when other people come to visit the graves... Maybe they're selling biscuits, they're selling halawa, they're selling bird seeds, they're selling little trinkets that you can buy so that you can put on the grave flowers and this and that. Those are the women that the Prophet was referring to in this hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The lady that does it all the time. As for the lady that does it sometimes, as some of the sahabiyat did. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha she visited the graves and she made salat over people at the grave with the knowledge of the other companions and no one said anything about it because there was no prohibition that they knew about one time even the prophet himself sallallahu alayhi wasallam witnessed that Aisha came to the grave she was actually at the grave and he didn't say anything and from what our religion tells us is that if something were to happen that was not permissible and he saw it, he heard about it, he knew about it, it was wajib for him to address the issue. Because if he remains silent about it, then that's his tacit approval, and it becomes part of his sunnah. Someone did something in his presence, he knew about it, he saw it, he heard about it. If he, was, if he remained quiet about it after knowing about it, then that's a proof that thing is not haram. Because as the rasul, as the one who makes the balag, and he talks about Allah and explains the religion, it's wajib that he has to talk about it. So he was in our house, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, and he very quietly stood up while he thought she was sleeping. He gathered his clothes. He put his clothes on and he gathered his shoes and the clothes he wanted to wear outside, and he left her house. And he went to the grave, and he entered into the grave. And when he went into the grave, he raised his hands up and he started making dua. And then after that long extended period of time and that long dua, just like that in the middle of the night, he came back. When he came back home and he got in the bed, 
he found that Aisha was breathing hard and her chest was going up and down as if she had been running or something wasn't normal, something wasn't natural. He said, what's the matter? Why are you breathing like that? She said, no reason, Ya Rasulullah. There's nothing going on. He said, if you don't tell me, Wallahi, Jibril is going to come and he's going to tell me. So she said, well, when you got up quietly and you took your clothes and your shoes and you went out that way, I became jealous. I thought you were going to go to another one of your wives' home on my night. So I came after you to find out where were you going. So the Prophet wasallam said, were you that black mark, that shadow that I saw at the grave? And when I turned, you sped away? She said, yes, that was me, Ya Rasulullah. So she was at the grave and he knew it. So he hit her in a chest in a way of playing with her. In a way of playing with her. Not very hard. He hit her in her chest and she said she felt it because that was him giving her adab. And the adab was, do you think I would do something that is impermissible? It's your night and I'm not going to be fair and just with you. No, that's what other people do. I wouldn't do that. She said, I couldn't help being jealous. Now that hadith has a lot of benefit in it. How Aisha went out at night time. So people will say, the Muslim woman can't go out at Maghrib. There's no delil for that. But it's better for her to be careful. And if she doesn't have to go out at night time, she shouldn't, but... There's no proof that says it's haram for her to go out at night. And also for those of us who have more than one spouse, Aisha's jealousy and her behavior caused her to have that wiswas. Radiallahu anha. The Prophet wasallam is going to the home of my durra. No way. I'm going to go see what's going on. The Prophet didn't break her leg. The Prophet didn't break her shoulder, dislocate her shoulder. This is something that she did. And... He told her what he did and why he did it, but he also hit in the chest, not in a hard way, but to let her know this wasn't okay. Another issue from the many benefits of the hadith is, shows how the man has to know what's going on inside of his house. He has to know what his wife is up to. He has to know what his children are up to. And also, the wife has to know what her children are up to. Has to know what the husband is up to without spying, without sneaking and compromising people's privacy. So this hadith, Ikhwani, the main proof that we're using it for here today is to show if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cursed every woman that went to the grave, then Aisha falls under that umbrella of what the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa heyhat, heyhat. A person may come and he may say, but maybe his words... Allah cursed these women maybe it came after the incident with Aisha maybe the incident with Aisha was the beginning of Islam but he said these other words at the end of Islam we say still still not the case because after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one of the great companions of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he died they prayed Janazah over him in the masjid Aisha didn't hear about it when she came she asked did they pray over him? They say yes, and they buried him in the Baqir. Aisha went out there, and people followed her, and she prayed the Salat of Al Janazah on the body of that man who had already been prayed upon in the masjid, and now she prayed over him with some of the people in the grave, in the maqbara, and the knowledge of the companions was there, and that's after the death of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it is permissible. For the lady to go to the grave for a janazah, after the janazah, to visit the grave, provided that when she goes, she has the etiquette of al-Islam. He said, they are not from us. The people who rip their shirts open and the people who scream and wail because of a death or the people who cut their hair off. And this is a practice that the kuffar of Jahiliya used to do. If something happened to a woman, she lost her child, but especially when someone died, she would go and do something drastic like cut all her hair off and make her head bald. And that was a form of showing her sadness and her sorrow. And this is what happens to women as well in our society without even knowing it. The lady is under a lot of stress, emotional pressure. She's 
just she's stressed out, depressed, she'll drastically cut her hair off. I don't say it's not permissible for her to cut her hair in a way that's appropriate, but not because of some musiba. So that's the first point that we wanted to bring to your attention that it is permissible in Al Islam, inshallah, for women to visit the graves provided they have the right etiquette and they behave properly at the grave. No screaming, no putting dirt on their faces, no slapping their cheeks and slapping the cheeks of other people, and no wailing and the other things that they used to do during the times of Al Jahiliyyah. Second issue that has been given to me is the issue of the trials of the grave. The trials of the grave. This issue of the trials of the grave is an issue that the scholars of the Sunnah used to write in their books of Aqidah, the books of Sulu Sunnah, Sharh Sunnah, the great Imam Ismail ibn Yahya al Muzani, and other than him. He has a book called Sharh Sunnah, like Al Barbahari. In his book, like the other scholars, they put this in their books that the people of the Sunnah, the people of Ahlul Hadith, the people of Al Islam, they believe in the punishment of the grave. And they believe in the trials and tribulations of the grave. Why did they bring this issue in these books? Because these books were written as a refutation against the deviant ideas that crept into the religion by the many different groups that their heads sprouted up. So from those groups are the khawarij of yesterday. Not the khawarij of today, Daesh, Boko Haram, Shabab, people like that. No. The Khawarij of yesterday. They have a group, they have a mentality, they're a group of people, they have a behavior, they have an understanding. In Aqidah, they believe things and they don't believe in other things. The Khawarij of today share some similarities, like Hosel Takfir. Hosel Takfir. And once they make Takfir on you, the knife is in the safe is coming out. Both groups, from back then and now, they share that. But the khawarij of yesterday, they used to have a lot of ibadah. The khawarij of yesterday, some of them, they had knowledge. Some of them are in the kutub al-sitta. They're from the shayukh of the imams of the kutub al-sitta. So anyway, back then, back then, the khawarij, the mu'tazila, and some of the murji'ah, not all of them, some of them, they said, using their intellect, there's no punishment in the grave. And how are you going to be punished in the grave? How is that going to happen? If a lion were to eat you up, if you fell into the ocean and the shark ate you up, if someone put you into a barrel of nitroglycerin and you disintegrated, there's nothing there to be punished. How is your soul going to be punished? The dude in the ground, the worms and the insects, they're going to eat your body up. So we've been here 1,437, 36 years after the Hijrah. People were in the grave for 2,000 years, 3,000 years. For a long time, people have been in the grave. And their prophets and their messengers came to them. Right now, they've disintegrated. They're there no more. So how are they going to be punished? As a result of that, the scholars of the Sunnah came and said, Hey, hey, you people are putting your intellect before what Allah said in the Quran and before what the prophet said. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Nabi told the people, Lo kana ahadun najiyan min adab al qabr la naja sa'd ibn Mu'ad. He said, if someone were going to be saved from the punishment of the grave, it would have been his companion Sa'd ibn Mu'ad. So that hadith establishes there's a punishment in the grave. He said, Inna lil qabr dakhtatan walo naja minha ahadun Verily in the grave, everybody is going to be squeezed. Everybody. One hadith said the squeezing that takes place, one side of his ribs are going to be squeezed all the way to the other side. Everybody. With no exceptions. He said if someone were going to escape that because of his virtues, because of his deen, because of who he is, it would have been my companion, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. But it's not going to happen. He's going to get it like everybody else. His mother, the mother of Saad, was at the grave. Saad was about to die. And she said, oh, Saad, don't worry. Don't worry. Wallahi, you're going to go to Jannah. Don't worry. 
The Prophet said, hey, Umm Sa'd, how do you know he's going to go to Jannah? Maybe Sa'd did something that you don't know about that is going to land him in the hellfire. But the Prophet knew that Sa'd was going to Jannah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was just telling Umm Sa'd, don't talk like that. When someone dies and someone is about to die, don't say those things that you have no knowledge about. And that's why, as it relates to the issues of the grave, this is all from the unseen. There's no room for us to have speculation and to make ijtihad and to do guesswork. We stop where the text stop with us. So the hadith of Munkar and Nakir is another example of that, that the one who doesn't answer correctly is going to be punished. The person in the grave who missed out on answering the questions right, a man will come to him who is exceedingly black. And the black here is not the black of the dunya. The man who comes to the good person in the grave, he will be exceedingly white, and his clothes will be exceedingly white. It's not the white of the white people here. Our brother Yahya is white, but he looks like Yahya. Not like that. And the black person looks like Dr. Abu Hanifa. No, not like that. The black and the white is different because it's dealing with the life of the barzakh and the hereafter. So the khamr over there, it's not like the khamr here. The milk over there is not like the milk here. So anyway, the person will come who didn't do well. He didn't practice the deen. Had a lot of mistakes and things like that. And they'll come in the form of a man that's very dark. Smoke will be coming out of his nose. Just to look at him in and of itself is a problem because the person is going to be afraid. And he's going to ask that person, who are you? The dead person will ask him, who are you? And he's in a state of terror. And he's already been hit in the back of his head. Who are you? And that man is going to say, I am your bad deeds that you did when you were in the life. I'm your bad deeds. And I'm here to punish you. And he will be punished until Yom Al-Qiyamah. And he's going to make a dua, oh Allah, don't, oh Allah, oh Allah, don't establish the hour. Don't let Yom Al-Qiyamah come. Just leave me right here because although I'm being punished right now, Yom Al-Qiyamah is going to be worse. So he doesn't want to meet Allah. He says, don't allow the hour to be established because what he's going to get after that, Yom Al-Qiyamah is worse. So that's from the proof of the adab of the Qabr. As for the ayat of the Quran, there are many. I just read maybe one or two to you right now. Like the statement of Allah Ta'ala, Hatta idha jaa'a ahaduhum al-mawt, qala rabbir ji'uni la'alli a'mal salihan fi ma taraktu. Kalla innaha kalimatun huwa qailuha wa min wara'ihin barzakhun ila yawmin yuba'athun. When one of them dies, the bad person, the non-Muslim, the munafiq, the Muslim who was evil, when one of them dies, he will say after dying, Oh my Lord, send me back to the dunya. Send me back to the, to the world in the hopes I'm going to do better works. I'm going to be righteous if I go back. Allah said, Kalla. No, 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 no. It's just a word that he's saying. If he were to come back, he's going to do the same thing. Because what was written for him, it was what was going to happen. He had a chance. He had a chance. He had a free will. He chose that path. If he went back, he's going to do the same thing. Because he can't escape what was written for him. And that does not mean that he was forced to do all of that evil. He wasn't forced. Right now I have the ability to get up and to leave. If I want to do that. And I have the ability to see here. Like everybody here. There's no force over me that I'm feeling that's making me sit here. Allah wrote that I'm going to stay in this place until I get up and I'm not getting up before that. But nobody can say, Allah made me stay here. Allah, la. Allah's decree was that. That thing was written. But he gave you a free will at the same time. So the ayah said, no, it's just a statement that he's making. And then he said, وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ barzakhun." And after this death right now, there's going to be the barzakh. And the barzakh is the second station for Bani Adam. 
We come out into this world and we're in the Hayat dunya and we're living on this top of the earth and we're doing what we're doing and there's a mo'e, there's going to be an appointment and that appointment is we're going to die and after we die we go on the other side of this earth and that's the barzakh until Yom Qiyama. So this particular ayat, it establishes that there is the barzakh and there's going to be punishment in it. Also, the second and last ayat that we'll share with you in this regard, the statement of Allah Ta'ala about what happens to Fir'aun and the people with Fir'aun. Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned, وَحَاقَ بِآلِ فِرْعَوْنَ سُؤُ الْعَذَابِ النَّارُ يُعْرَدُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ النَّارُ يُعْرَدُونَ عَلَيْهَا غَدُوًا وَعَشِيًّا وَيَوْمَ تَقُومُ السَّاعَةَ أَدْخِلُوا آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ أَشَدَّ الْعَذَابِ Allah Ta'ala said, and the people with Fir'aun, they're going to be punished because of their misgivings and their evil deeds. And the hellfire, while they are in their graves, every day they are exposed to the hellfire. In the daytime and in the nighttime, every single day is being put to them. Being put to them, why? To let them know, this is what you're going to get. In addition to what they're suffering from right now. Depending upon what their crimes were, it's going to determine what their punishment is. Like those many ahadith that tell what people are going to be getting when they're in their graves. Those people will be scratching their faces and scratching the meat off of their faces and scratching the meat off of their chests. Prophet said to Jibril, who are those people? Jibril said, those are the people who used to talk bad about the other Muslims, talk about their honor. And they would say things, they didn't have proof, they shouldn't have said it, and that's their punishment. A lot of issues for the people who drink khamr, for the people who do whatever they do. It's going to be problems. So these two ayat and other than them, and many of the ahadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, they prove and they show there's an adab of the qabr. So the Muslims should not be like the people of their intellect. The Nabi told everybody here, Ta'awwadhu billahi min adab al-qabr. When you pray, seek refuge in Allah from the punishment of the grave. How can someone come now and say, there's no punishment of the grave because he, his body was devoured by the insects inside of the earth. His body decayed and there's nothing there. And that's not, even if that's true, his body is not there, Allah is able to do whatever he wants to do. The third issue, Khwani, is the issue of the people's souls and where are their souls, the people who have died right now. Our relatives and the people who have died, where are their souls right now? There's a lot of ikhtilaf between the scholars of Islam because there are a lot of proofs about this. But in our aqidah, what we have to say and be in balance is people's souls are in different places depending upon the person and what he did good or bad everybody is not in the same place those people who made jihad and they made jihad correctly so I can never escape the issue of jihad in our religion because it's going to always come up so to be afraid of the word to run away from the word to bury the word is not wise and to talk about it unnecessarily or in the wrong way is not wise but the question comes as a Muslim I want to know what happens to the souls well if a person made jihad the correct way and he was killed or he just participated in the jihad then his soul is going to be inside of the body of green birds that are going to be flying around in the Jannah and under the Arsh of Allah. Now some people, when they hear something like that, they shake their heads and say, man, the Muslims are out of it. Soul in a green bird flying around. Allah can do whatever he wants to do. And we see that on a daily basis. So as a Muslim, we can't allow that mentality to cause us to be shy or to hinder us from believing in our religion. As a matter of fact, we should put the person who has a problem embracing what we just said, what the prophet said, we should put him on the defensive. 
and say, how dare you? Be mutakabbir, mustakbir, and jahil, and anid. How are you going to be so stubborn and arrogant? Can you not see that sun coming up every day and setting every day? That alone is a sign for you that the one who was doing that and changing these seasons, and he's responsible for all of this stuff, that he does what he wants to do. It's difficult about that. And how are you going to allow your little mind to restrict and constrict Allah's qadr? His ability, his qudra. And that's why none of those ayahs of the Quran, they say, وَمَا قَدْرُ اللَّهِ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ They didn't consider Allah the way he should be considered. When they disbelieved in Yom al and they disbelieved that he could send a Nabi and a Rasul, they disbelieved that he can reveal a book and so forth and so on. So that's one hadith that shows that some souls are there. Some souls will be in their grave being punished. Other souls will be in their grave and their grave will be a riyad, a roda from the riyad of al-jannah. The one who answers the question correctly, who's your Lord? Allah is my Lord. What's your religion? Al-Islam. What did you say about that man? He's Abdullah and the Rasul. The angels will say to him, you answered correctly because Allah allowed you to answer to correctly. Now sleep the way the newly married man sleeps. So if a man gets married for the first time, as you brothers, some of you have experienced getting married that first, very first time. Those of you who are going to get married, one of the best days in the life of a man is when he marries for the very first day. They say sleep the way the newly married man sleeps. So he's going to be laid down and then he's going to see his place in Jannah later on. And then that man will come to him with the white and he'll say, who are you? He looks nice. He smells good. He has a nice face. He gives that guy a nice feeling about the whole situation he says I'm your good deeds your salat your zakat your hajj your umrah your birru walidain I'm your sabr I'm all of that I'm your sabr that you had with your husband and I'm your sabr that you had with your wife and so forth and so on and then he's going to say oh Allah establish the hour oh Allah establish the hour let yom al qiyamah hurry up and come and that's the meaning of the hadith man ahabba liqa Allah Anyone who loves to meet Allah, Allah wants to meet him. That one who puts in his grave and he says, Oh Allah, establish the hour. He wants to meet Allah because he saw what he's going to get in Jannah. And Allah wants to meet him. That hadith, whoever wants to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. It does not mean for someone to go out and kill himself wanting to meet Allah. To commit suicide because you read this hadith. I want to meet Allah, so I'm going to kill myself. I'm driving crazy and recklessly, and I take a lot of chances with my life. You know some of these people right now in America, if you want to join one of these gangs, every year they're coming up with crazy things. If you want to join one of these gangs, they give you a gun, a revolver, not an automatic, one of those guns with the bullets in it. You spin it around one bullet, you put it on your head, and you shoot. If it goes off, you're done. You don't join the game. You're done. If it doesn't go off, they pass it to the next person. And he shoots it. Who in his right mind would take a chance with his life like that? A person who gives no value to what life is all about and what's going to come after life. So the shadow of all of that kadab is that some people's souls will be in their grave. The Prophet said another group of people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they will have a whiteness and a light to them and others will have a darkness and a gloom to them a gloomy glow dark glow they will be on the right side of adam and on the left side of adam the ones with the white glow on the right the ones with the dark gloomy glow on the left when adam looks to the right and he sees those he laughs and he's happy when he looks to the left and he sees those those souls he starts to cry because those are his children who will be in the Jannah. That's their souls with Adam. And over there is children. And their souls are dark and gloomy. And they're going to be in the hellfire. And there are many, many hadith that describe different things that are going on. So without going through all of those hadith, that's the answer. Where are the souls of the people? Some of them are in the grave and some of them are in other places. And this is what they call the ikhtilaf at tanawa the different types of issues, it's the same issue, but again, 
Allah does what he wants to do. And his slaves, they just have to get with the program. They just have to get with the situation. The last issue, Ikhwani, that I was given was the trial of the grave, the reward and the punishment, visiting the grave, and the place of the soul. As for the rewards and the punishment, the scholars of Islam, as we told you, they never left any stone unturned. Any and everything you want to know about this religion, there's going to be not just one book, but multiple books that you can pick up just on that issue alone. For those of you who do speak Arabic, most of these books, you can download them off of the internet. Most of them are not translated because the original language of this religion is Arabic. You want to learn your religion? Do your best to struggle, make jihad, make efforts to learn as much Arabic as possible. Doesn't mean if you know the language that you already know your religion. I met a lady, or I was called by a lady. She was asking me the question, you know, the people from Denmark, they were and are her country from Kuwait. The people are boycotting Denmark for what they said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So some of those countries in the Khalij and the Gulf, they started boycotting the companies of Denmark, which is a big problem because the ilah of many of these people are economics and money. So they said, officially, we're, we're not doing business with you people. So the Muslim lady picks up the phone and she says, I have some milk still left over, some milk. And the milk comes from Denmark. It's Denmark milk. And it's the only type of milk that my children drink. But because of the boycott, is it permissible for me to drink this or not drink it? This is a lady who has Arabic as her tongue. And I'm not going to say she's stupid and that's a stupid question. But these are the type of questions that come from the Amma Tanaz, just the regular people from our community, just the regular people. So me, or this one, or that one, who's giving dawah in Allah. If that's the Arab lady's situation, what do you think is the situation and the reality of the revert sister? The revert brother. The many people from our community don't know much about Al-Islam. And then here I come, here I come giving dawah to them. And I'm going to talk to them about issues that are not relevant. Issues that are not connected to their reality. I'm going to engage them in planting the seeds in the hearts and the minds of the community. To hate other Muslims. And all he is is a basic brother who's trying to learn his religion. So those ulama of al-Islam, they wrote about these issues. From them is al-Imam al-Qurtabi, the famous Maliki jurist and mufassir. And he was from Spain. He's actually a European, really, from Cordoba. From Cordova. Al-Imam Abu Bakr al-Qurtabi. He wrote a book and he called his book at tafkira fi ahwal al-Mawta wa amur al akhirah if you just said a tathkira and you put that inside of the internet, you'll get this book, a tathkira. And it'll come and tell you about what Allah Azza wa Jalla has prepared for the believers and the people of Al-Jannah, the people of the grave and the people of Al-Jannah, and the opposite. What Allah prepared for the people who are going to be punished in the grave and who are going to be punished in the hellfire. Everything you need to know. And no book is going to have everything. So the next scholar came, Al-Imam Ibn Rajab Al-Hanbali, who came after Al-Imam Al-Qurtabi. He wrote a book and he called his book At-Takhweef Min An-Nar Wa Ta'rif Bihal Dar Al-Bawar. It's the book of frightening the people and scaring the people from the punishment of the hellfire and letting them know about the reality of the people who live in the Barzakh, who live in that place that is after death and before the Jannah. And the last book that I will bring to your attention to get all of that information is the book by Imam Suyuti. Does anyone know Imam Suyuti when he died? Anybody know? Imam Suyuti died in what year? Huh? Good job. No, good try. Anybody know? Especially for my students. Anybody know? Nobody. I told you guys, Imam Suyuti is an imam in every science. He wrote in everything, everything. Any science you can think of, he was a writer. 
and he never got married. He was one of those scholars who never got married. And we don't say, I'm following Ali Mama Suyuti. Ali Mama Suyuti as well, he gave some opinions in support of the Molid. He gave some opinions that we don't accept. But we do acknowledge when a scholar made a mistake, he still gets one reward. But don't come and tell me, as Suyuti said, Ali Mama Suyuti said that the Prophet's mother and father will be raised up Yom al Qiyam and they're going to take the Shahada. Uh, that the Prophet's mother and the father, the Prophet came and they were raised up and he gave them the Shahada. And then they were put back in a grave and they died as believers. When the Quran and the Sunnah tells us contrary to that, there's no proof of what that is. That's all weak, that's not true. But he took that position. But he's a great scholar in Al Islam. And you'll always hear his name, always. So, Al Imam al Suyuti, Jalal al Din al Suyuti, for the community to know, he, was, he died year 9 11. 9 11. So, you'll always remember, Al Suyuti died 911. I told you, students, this is an easy way. Sometimes you just got to figure out a way to memorize particular things. This would happen. I'm not talking about 9-11, this 9-11 here, but it helps you to understand. 9-11. If you go to the internet, you can have this information to see here and to give you all of that. It is quite a bit. So we're going to stop now, Ikhwani. If you brothers have any questions, inshallah, ta'ala, concerning today's dars, we'll deal with those questions right now. Ahsanallah alaykum. Do you brothers have any questions? Tafadr ya akhi. She can go alone. If a woman wants to go to the graveyard and it's safe for her to go, she can go alone. Aisha went by herself behind the Nabi because he didn't know that she was coming. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And going to the graveyard is not like traveling. So if she goes to a grave that's far, far away, then obviously she has to have a mahram to get there. But to go to the grave in a distance that is reasonable, no, no problem with that, inshallah. Tfadiyahi Nuruddin. The person who has a debt and he died. The person in the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the person who had a debt, his soul, and this is one of the places where the soul is a different place, his soul is going to be suspended. It's going to be, he deserves to go into the Jannah, but he doesn't go to the Jannah. His soul is going to be suspended until his debt is paid. Or until the people who he owe that money to are satisfied with their haq coming back to him. Coming back to them. So that's what happens with a person who has a debt. That is pretty serious. Now I'm little man. Is that Isra? Isra, I met your brother today, Professor Iftikhar. Today in London. Fadl. When, some, when a wife's husband dies, why do they get four, four months to mourn? Uh, if a lady's husband dies, she has to go through a period of mourning. Mourning. Not in the morning time. To mourn. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And it's called Al-Ihdad. And it is four months and 10 days. And that is the longest mourning period. Everybody else gets three days. His mother, his father, his brother, his sister, his children, son, daughter, niece, nephew. If a person dies, people have three days to mourn that individual. After three days, they have to get up and get on with their life. Doesn't mean they can't be sad after three days. But you have three days to be incapacitated. Three days to be out of commission. You can't move. You're in a daze. You're in a bubble. You still think and expect the person's going to walk through the door. Because you can't believe it. You have three days to be like that. After that third day passes, you have to get up and get out and do something. The only person who can mourn the individual longer than that is the wife when her husband dies. She has to do this. So she has to try to stay in her house. 
And then she has to try not to use any perfume. She doesn't beautify herself. She's just in the house. My little brother wants to know why. The wisdom from that is, it goes to show the tremendous rights that the husband has over the wife. He doesn't have small rights. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Lo kuntu amira ahadin li an yasjuda li ahadin la marutul mar'a li an tasjud li zawjiha. If I were to order someone to make sajda and bow down to some other human being, I'd have ordered the woman, bow down to your husband. Make sajda. But there's no bowing down except to Allah. So it goes to show that lady, when she gets upset for something, especially if she has a good husband and he didn't really do anything the way she is. She's spoiled. She's, something's wrong with her. She has bad akhlaq. It's her. And she has a good husband. This is something she should think about. And the one who her husband is a trial for her. This is something she should think about as well. Her worship, her salat, won't be accepted by Allah until her husband is pleased with her. So that's the wisdom, my man. Tafadli, ya akhi. Yes, time uh, is in the power of Allah Azza wa Jalla, as the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا تسبوا الدهر فإن الله هو الدهر يقلب الليل والنهار. Don't curse the time because Allah is time. He changes the day into the night, the night into the day. So it's Allah's property. So as a result of that, he does with the time what he wants to do with the time in terms of shortening it or elongating it allowing people to live a long time or a short time, and allowing the duration of things to look this way or that way. So, Yomu Kiyama, the baton of the eye, for the bad person, it's going to be a long time. Like the people who are going to say who are in the hellfire, they're going to say to the angel Matic, go to your Lord and ask him to give us reprieve, lighten up for us. This is what will happen. What's going on? And Matic will leave. And they'll be punished in a period of 50,000 years waiting for him to come back. When he comes back, he will look more stern, more tough, meaner than he did when he left. When he comes back with that mean look, they can see this is bad news. And they're being punished. Malik will say to them, my Lord said your punishment is double now. And they waited 50,000 years doing what? Getting what they were getting. Now he comes back after all that time and it's even more. So the contraction and restriction of time is in Allah's hands and that is true. The good people, they benefit from the time and the bad people, they are punished with the time. And even the dunya, that is also partly true. The Prophet ﷺ was married to 11 women. He had all of those children. He had a community and yet Look at all the things he was able to accomplish in one day. In one day, every day, he accomplished a lot. Why? Because his time had barakah. His time had barakah. The little bit of time that he had, he was able to squeeze out of all that time a lot of obedience to Allah. Well, we, we don't get a lot out of our day. Fadri Akhi. Anybody who did wrong to someone else and he didn't seek his forgiveness before he passed away, at some point he has to be responsible for taking people's rights. So if he didn't seek forgiveness, he'll be one of those individuals who his issue is with Allah. Allah will deal with him in a way that is fair and just and in the way that he deserves. And sometimes he'll forgive him. And he didn't necessarily deserve that, but it's from Allah's ihsan and his fadl. Sometimes he has to be responsible to be punished for it. But those people, even if Allah forgives them, Allah is going to repay the people who are oppressed. And that's why, Akhi, 
when the people are questioned by Munkar and Nakir, the one who answers the question right or wrong is going to be said to the one who goes to Jannah, look over there. And they'll look over there and they'll say, this would have been your place in the hellfire had Allah not saved you. Look over there. This is your place in the Jannah because Allah saved you. And then he'll make that dua. Oh Allah establish the hour. That chair over there is going to be empty. And Allah promised in the Quran he's going to fill up the hellfire with jinn and men. So the people who oppressed other people are going to get their chair and that chair as well. People who Fir'aun killed all those people from Beni Israel. These people killing all these people. They're going to take his chair, his chair, his chair, his chair. And the opposite holds true. The one from the Jannah, the one from the hellfire, it would be said, look over there. That was your chair in Jannah. But Allah didn't give you the success. That's your chair in the hellfire. Oh Allah, don't establish the hour. In the Jannah, that chair is going to be empty. There's a chair that's empty. Someone's going to get that chair because he oppressed him. Someone's going to get that chair that's empty because he did good and so forth and so on. So everybody's going to get their recompense. This brother and then that brother and then that brother and then that city. Shalom. Fadda. Do angels ever die? There's ikhtilaf between the scholars. What seems to be the case is that the horn will be blown and everybody is going to die except those that Allah gives permission for them not to die. But we don't have hadith to say he was excluded, he was excluded, he was excluded. Some scholars said that the angel who blow the horn, he doesn't die because he had to blow the horn. Prophet said when the second horn is blown, he's the first one to wake up and he opens his eyes and comes back to life. And then he'll see Musa standing there awake. He said, I don't know if Musa died or if Allah exempted him and he didn't die. So that shows we can't come and say he died or he didn't. We don't know. So about the angels, Allah knows best. Are we to assume that when Aisha was in the honor, they declared in the cemetery, they were going to be buried? No, no, Aisha didn't lead the prayer, but someone led the prayer for Aisha. That's what she used to do. In the month of Ramadan, she memorized the Quran, but she used to let her slave boy lead her in the Quran and Taraweeh, Qiyam al He didn't memorize, she did, but she allowed him to take the Mus'haf and lead her in the prayer, reading from the Mus'haf. He would read, and because he didn't memorize and she wanted to read the whole Quran, she would be back there listening. So she never said, although. She said, I'm a woman, I know what I'm doing, there's special rules. She still always followed the religion. So people prayed for her and she prayed behind them. That brother and that brother. Concerning <coughs> the Barzakh, life is done, you're finished. It's done. There's nothing else to do. And that's why the Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if a person dies, three things follow him, two return and one stays with him. His money, his wealth and his family, they go with him and they return. And his deeds go with him and his deeds stay with him. The deeds from the dunya. And that's why the dead person said when he died, Oh Allah, return me back so I can do good deeds. Because you can't do good deeds down here no more. It's done. You're, there's no takalluf, taklifa. Do this and do that. None of that. The prophets and the messengers are in the grave and they are praying in a way that Allah knows the reality. They're praying. But it's a special ruling. It's not like us being up here and we have to pray Dhuhr, Asa, Maghrib, Shat. So there's no taklifa in the hereafter. In the barzakh, there's none of that stuff. Now is the time to do deeds. Last question, my man, right there. May Allah have rahma upon your deceased. I 
Uh, when we lose people who are close to us and relatives, we should take a, um, a, a lesson from the death. Uh, life is short. Get your affairs correct. Don't carry on these disputes that are unnecessary because people are not going to be here forever. And in regards to how to mourn, do the good things that are going to benefit the dead person by following up what the Sunnah told us to do. Help to create some sadaqa ajariya for the dead person on his behalf and just avoid innovation and avoid masiyah. Disobeying the Prophet Sallallahu at this time. When people are born, festivities in Islam. When people are born, when people die, when people get married. These festivities are the times when you see the religion and the reality of the community. People don't know what they're doing. We do all kind of crazy things. So as it relates to mourning the deceased. After three days, that's all the mourning that we do. Now what we have to do is try to extend the legacy of the person who died. Let people know this is what they were about. And we try our best to follow up and to be in his way. Like the sheikh who was buried here the other day. Or who died here the other day. Um, he was the relative of Saidi the Naim. Their mother's brother. It's one of the first people from the elders who participated in this masjid, Alul Hadith. The Masjid Alul Hadith used to be in Alam Rock, a little small house up there on uh, St. George's Road. Up there. It was a little house. We have some elders who from day one, their faces were in the sauce. And now they're dying. Like a few months ago, the Sheikh Muhammad Deen, the grandfather of Harun and those brothers from uh, Old Bury. And we went to his funeral and they asked me to talk. And I was telling the people... Herein, under this ground, lies part of the history of Alul Hadith in Birmingham. This man right here. So, as we saw his grandsons, they were the ones putting most of the dirt in handling the situation. And I looked at that and I said, look at this man's grandsons. All three of them are on the sunnah. All three of them want to do things the right way. That's a nice legacy. If a person checks out, to be able to leave that behind. His children know what they're doing. And their children know what they're doing. So this is the way we remember, we celebrate, we mourn the people from our dead. Okay, Ikhwani, may Allah bless you. Oh, 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 tomorrow is Valentine's Day. <laughs> it is not permissible in the deen of Allah, Ikhwani, for us to do anything with this Valentine's Day. Anybody who buys a card, he buys flour, he buys chocolate, he says to his wife, I love you because of this day. He gives a candle light dinner. Any of that because it's Valentine's Day is kofrun and shirkun. I don't say you're a kafir and mushrik. But this Valentine's Day is one of those holidays of the kuffar that Islam says be far, far away from this. Don't deal with it in any shape, form, or fashion. We love our wives every day. And we love our husbands every day. And we love each other every day. And our religion showed us how to show that love. هذا وصلى الله وصلى مبارك على نبينا وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين. سلام عليكم. Hey, my man Saleh, where you been, homie?